almost 15 minutes late. We're starting a little bit early. Um, I want to say thank you on behalf of the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation for joining us um, for what's actually the second event already in Ecogram 3 on Africa. Um, and I won't say much, I'll be brief, um, but I will say that this is a really ambitious, wonderful project um, that Joanna has brought to the school with Mitchell Joachim. Um, it started three years ago um, that we really had to seriously inject sustainability and ecological issues into the school. And three years ago, it was a one-day conference. Last year, it was a one-week conference. And this year, there are events spanning two weeks with two other collaborating organizations involved with us, including our friends at the Alliance Francaise, the French Institute, um, who have introduced us to people who we never knew we'd meet before. It's wonderful. And um, our friends, the Committee of Global Thought, at Columbia University. Um, and so I, I will just say that I, it is a, on behalf of the dean and on behalf of the school, um, we are so indebted and grateful to Joanna, who teaches both here and in Parsons, and she should get some sort of frequent flyer miles for the subway rides back and forth that she's done. Um, but uh, I hope you will join us over the next few weeks, um, or two weeks, uh, and enjoy. And anything you do miss, I want to remind everyone, uh, we do record everything, and it's on our website. Um, under GSAP on iTunes. So um, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I have the first image, please? Uh, and maybe turn the lights down a little. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, the Dean, Mark Wigley, for uh, hosting and supporting this ongoing event since 2008. Uh, on behalf of my colleague, uh, who I collaborated with through the two previous ecograms, Mitch Joachim and myself. Um, tonight's event, uh, event has different venues and several partners and co-presenters. I'd like to just welcome them briefly, uh, and then I'll make four points and hand over to Fausta. Um, first of all, we're very excited and honored to, to welcome the Alliance Francaise, the French Institute, FIAF, uh, co-hosting this evening for including us in their wonderful Crossing the Line Festival. I'm hoping to have an image any moment. Um, uh, which is a platform for artists from both sides of the Atlantic whose powerful practices and ideas um, offer us critical reflections, reflections on the world we inhabit. This year, there's a specific focus on the artist's role as a criti critically important thinker and catalyst for social change. Since this is an ongoing emphasis of the Ecogram conferences, as I will explain shortly, when we met with the two co-curators, Lili Chopra, the artistic director, and Simon Dove, um, director of the Herberger Institute School of Dance at Arizona State University, they're both here tonight. They immediately thought to introduce us to Faust and Linai Kula's work, who will, who has happily joined us this evening. Um, I would also like to thank the director of the African Film Festival, Mahen Bonetti, who suggested and arranged for us that we screen the documentary film Burning in the Sun by Cambria Batlow, which we did this afternoon. Um, the Committee for Global Thought at Columbia for co-hosting the panel about economy and aid to be moderated by Professor Joseph Stiglitz next Wednesday, uh, September 29th. Um, and uh, uh, Gavin Browning from Studio X for hosting Mabel's, uh, Mabel Wilson, Professor at GSAP, and Peter Tolkien's exhibit of photographs of modern architecture from Ghana to coincide with Ecogram that opens this Thursday. Professor Saskia Sassen helped us brainstorm, and her uh, event is a whole day closing event, Cities and Eco Crisis, um, next Friday, October 1st. Andres Lepic from the Museum of Modern Art, who helped us uh, bring uh, Francis Quere and helped us with the whole process of the invitation, who's uh, curating the exhibit that opens next Tuesday, Small Scale, Big Change. One of our participants is in that show. And finally, last but not least, my colleague Ben Prowski for uh, Director of Special Events here at the school and Lucia uh, Halajan for their incredible energy and inspiration and collaboration. Okay, now I'm gonna make these four points. One, the concept of ecogram in general. 
uh, and then the concept of the ecogram this year. Um, this series as a whole explores what might be an appropriate approach to sustainability. Uh, it, it goes against the grain in comparison with other schools of architecture, we think, that have placed a heavier emphasis on technological know-how. For us, the question of defining sustainability is an ongoing concern of these conferences. Um, the, uh, the, no matter what sustainability involves, uh, there is, of course, a sense of responsibility to future generations. The question is, what form will that take? What are the forms of responsibility that one can identify specifically for, you know, for this year in relation to, to Africa? Um, if ecology is about planetary housekeeping, as our Dean Mark Wigley once wrote, what can it tell us about home, the place where we actually live? Uh, we in the North have for a very long time uh, neglected, uh, been terrible housekeepers to the South. This conference is motivated by the challenge of how we may improve that. Um, and I will explain. Ecology is also about interdependency. Um, Kiosis is, is a term by the Stoic philosophers. Um, think about, thinking about uh, this conference, uh, the idea that uh, humans belong to a sense of, it's about, it's about a sense of community and about a sense of awareness of others. So part of the project of this conference is to broaden our sense of familiarity with the other, which isn't this what education is about, um, certainly architectural education, since architecture is entirely linked with global social and political forces and of course economic and environmental ones. We hope to teach the students how to become global citizens and be attentive to the needs of others. Finally, Africa. Uh, why Africa? We all know that the demands of uh, anthropogenic activities are putting uh, on, the, on the world's ecosystems, are putting the world's ecosystems under stress. This is much more acute in the global south and particularly in Africa. Dr. Wangari Mutamatai, Nobel a Peace Prize winner from 2004 has put it this way, and I quote, Africa is the continent that will be hit the hardest by climate change. Unpredictable rains and floods, prolonged drought, subsequent crop failure, rapid desertification, among other signs of global warming, have in fact already begun to change the face of Africa, end quote. Africa is of course an entire continent in terms of language and culture, the world's most diverse, the cradle of mankind, where humans first evolved. It possesses a history stretching back to five millennia to some of the world's e earliest ancient civilizations. The conference is not meant to essentialize or claim that we can talk about it in a simple kind of overgeneralized way. But at the same time, we feel that it's a vast part of the world that we know very little about, especially in the field of architecture. Why don't we know more about modern architecture in Africa? Why is our knowledge up to the uh, vernacular, but no more. One could say, then, that this conference is long overdue. Um, and Mabel's project uh, in Peter's uh, on Thursday is starting to address this, uh, hopefully. Um, now, uh, so the ecogram, the goal of this year's ecogram is to see sustainability through the lens of the global south, and particularly Africa. Um, as regards to climate change, Africa stands out uh, as the continent that has contributed the least amount of greenhouse gases, uh, even though it's meant to be, it, it will be the one who will, one of the one, uh, places that will suffer, suffer the most. In a fair world in which all people have equal rights to the atmosphere, this should mean that Africa has considerable rights to emit which have not yet been exercised. But one of the perversities of climate change negotiations is that it is the big emitters who exercise power, the e US, the EU, China, India, and Brazil. They can hold the, the, the rest of the world to ransom in a way, but people who are most likely to be hit the hardest by global warming have little or no voice since they have nothing to trade. This, of course, raises issues of global equity, uh, and in Africa, in very much in an extreme way, um, and that is an important question in the ongoing exploration of sustainability. Is sustainability more an issue of social resilience, disruption, and dislocation? Um, uh, 
uh, tonight's event uh, on the, is looking at uh, artistic production in Africa. So on the one hand, Africa is a place that has suffered and predicted to suffer more as a result of climate change. On the other, there's reason for optimism given the rapid development of places like Ghana, as we will see with uh, Mabel's show. Uh, and it's something we would like to understand a little better with this year's conference. Uh, we also want to understand how the question of sustainability uh, will change, what will happen to the definition of sustainability as a result uh, of, of looking at, at this um, work. Um, when we talked, when we met with Faustan uh, uh, and his partner Virginie last February, we were incredibly moved by his description of, of his work in creating spaces that he calls invention boxes, not yet realized, in his uh, place of origin, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, in a, a small community called Kisangani, uh, where he says that he sees them as places where they can search, doubt, and have performances. Um, and we thought that this is very much uh, starting to show a way of a kind of social sustainability, an idea of a social sustainability that we wanted to feature uh, here. Um, so uh, in a way, perhaps we, we could say that Faustan's, uh, that the Congo um, maybe is at the heart of the African experience as it's both one of the richest countries, especially in terms of national resources and one of the bloodiest in terms of modern history and political instability. So how do you make art and culture in that context and what does it do? What are its goals? So uh, we want to situate uh, that exploration um, tonight um, and uh, to understand, uh, first of all, Faustin's cultural project that actually includes architecture and building. And then uh, after Faustin talks to us a little bit about his work, um, I will introduce our other two very distinguished um, participants, Professor Okui and Weiser and Professor Mamadou Diouf, um, who will um, engage in a discussion about some of these issues. So with that, let me introduce, uh, the, here we see the Crossing the Line Festival. I recommend that you try to go uh, see some of these events, especially, especially, oops, it's, I think it's working. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, there, is a, there is an event, um, Faustan has already performed uh, uh, in uh, New York a few nights ago, but there are some uh, urban events that uh, our students and uh, architect audience might be interested in, architects in the audience. Uh, one has to do with um, urban farming, several have to do with urban farming, and one has to do with bodies in space, uh, Willie Donor, so those will come up in a minute. And I would like to introduce Faustin, um, dancer and choreographer, Faustin Linae Kula, uh, lives and works in Kisangani, Northeast uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, former Zaire, uh, former independent state of Congo, former Bel Belgian Congo. <laughs> he teaches in Africa, Europe, uh, Vienna, Brussels, uh, Cork, uh, Cork, excuse me, um, Lisbon, and in the United States. Uh, he, um, has uh, lived uh, in Europe um, for a long time, but then, uh, as I understand from your uh, text, uh, at some point uh, in two thousand and five, you were visiting the U.S. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina, right? And at that point, you decided to move back. You had you had a dream. Perhaps you'll talk to us about it. Uh, move back to the Congo and see how you can actually make a difference. To uh, to art and culture there. So perhaps with that, I leave you, um, Faustin. Please welcome Faustin Linai Kula. And I
Hello, everyone. My name is Fustin Lignecula. Um, I'm a dancer. I come from the Democratic Republic of, uh, of, of Congo, that the former Zaire, because when I was born, the country was known as Zaire. It was only when I turned 19 in 1997 that I, it happened overnight that the country changed names. And since that time, some kind of, I grew, or developed some kind of obsession with history or memory, trying to understand what really um, was going on, because then I realized that I didn't know anything about where I came from. I didn't know anything about my country. Um, therefore, I didn't know much about myself. And with that, I came to realize one thing, um, that besides the form you could call dance or theater or video, because I work with uh, all those elements, maybe ultimately the best way to call myself would be to say I'm a storyteller. And in 2001, because going back to Congo was like about, was in two stages, or so to Kisangani, um, it went through Kinshasa first. In 2001, I realized that the kind of stories that I was interested in, or at least the kind of stories that got me um, moving, were not stories from exile. And so, even though I'm very much interested in the question of exile, what is it? Uh, and I even wrote sometime, like in 99, like maybe Land of Exile or Native Land. Perhaps everywhere is uh, about exile. Perhaps my only true country is my body. But then, in 2001, it was very clear for me that maybe I didn't want to tell stories of exile. So it was like, okay, I'll go back to the Congo. The country was um, in war then, so I could not go back to Kisangani, which is the city where I grew up in the northeast. So I went to Kinshasa because at least it was safer. And also, yeah, I was playing it safe. I didn't want to go and get um, like locked up there and not be able to move outside the country. At least it was possible from Kinshasa. And when I got to Kinshasa, I realized that I was alone wanting to do like contemporary dance work or dance theater, visual theater. I was alone, so it was like, if I don't want to spend the rest of my life making solos, I just have to train other people. I just have to train other people who can work with me. And therefore, I started this project that we called Studios Kabako. We didn't have like even a 10 by 10 meter room, but Nonetheless, we said we have studios, we have many of them. Because then, um, the most important f thing for me was you know, to talk of these studios and, as a mental space, or mental spaces, because things are so rough, socially and economically, politically, it's like a dead end, and for most, people, not, not only young people, it's like there is only one solution, it's to leave the country, it will be definitely better than what, when you're there, you, you, you believe in, but once you find yourself in Paris or London or uh, Brussels, you realize that it's not exactly paradise as we're dreaming of there. So for me, going back to the Congo and beginning a project, it was very clear that I didn't want to just create a company where I'll do my work in my own corner and that's it. So it's like, we'll make like studios, mental spaces that we need to open here to say to ourselves that, hey, it's possible. It's possible to be here, to dream from here, to dream about possibilities from here. Because one of the, th the main problems um, for us down there is that whenever there's a problem, we turn to the outside. Um, it's either NGOs or, yeah, the IMF or World Bank, whatever, you know. And, and so that's why I, I, I talk of ourselves as being in colonial states, because legitimacy comes from outside. But 
How can we be here and imagine things for ourselves? You may wonder if that's dance or if that's contemporary African dance. To me, it was not the most important thing. Like, how do you call one's attempt to carve out spaces of dreams? Because we need to dream in the middle of a hopeless situation. I know that around and inside me, my heritage is primarily ruins. But how can I continue doing something there? And so the Studio Kabakos project began as this space where I can meet people who want to do dance, I'd give workshops, and see what would happen. But from the very beginning, it was very clear that I, uh, it would not be um, healthy, mentally healthy, for me to be the only one teaching there. And because I had a network of friends in Europe, I started inviting them. Because again, we grew up in a, I grew up in a dictatorship, in a single thinking system. And so there was this risk that if I was the only one doing this kind of work there, yeah, I would become another Mobutu. And that's definitely not something that I dream of. So we started like giving workshops and I divide friends and at the same time I was working and producing work because I didn't want to wait um, either like for two or three years until people have got enough training and you can say they're kind of professionals now so we can create uh, professional work with them. So um, the attention shifted like from technical craft to the quality of people's presence on stage. And the work has been really around that. And this was also very important because again, when you grow up, uh, you grow up in a dictatorship, one of the things that um, you come to realize is that individuals do not exist. There is only one individual that's uh, the dictator, the rest you just have to follow. And so if there is anything political about the work that I'd like to do, it's maybe just that, to go back to the individual and give that space where it's like, that's why I talk of my own dancers and attempt to remember my name. And with the name, um, what I like about the idea of names is that it's not only a me, 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 me stuff, because immediately the name relates you know, um, creates a whole web of relationships. It talks about myself in relation to a larger picture, the family, but it goes beyond my family. It goes to history, for instance. Because like, uh, until the 30s, we didn't have the family name tradition in the Congo. It started in the 30s with the Belgians. So the, um, the family name is a colonial institution. And therefore, if I call myself Linie Kula, which is my grandfather's name, who started the family name tradition because in, uh, in 1936, when he had his first child, the Belgians had instituted this new um, reality. Immediately, I'm talking about myself, but I'm talking also about history. And so how can I work with other artists and lead them back to that. And the only way of imagining a community if, is it's if you have responsible individuals who get together. And so after four years of working in Kinshasa, training and creating work, but also supporting other dance artists work to try and nurture and push them forward so that, yeah, again, the whole idea is not to be alone because that would be suicidal for me. And I, um, in 2005, yeah, I was, I was in the US teaching at the University of uh, Gainesville, uh, of Florida in Gainesville. And there was this strange dream. I dreamt about uh, an uncle of mine who had passed away um, some years before, and he was asking for water. I called my mother the following day and said, hey, I dreamt about um, Uncle Jean-Pierre last night, and he was asking for water. What does that mean? So she went to talk to my grandmother, 
and they said, okay, we need to make a ceremony. So I, but you need to make a ceremony. So I, I was far away, I sent money so that they can make a ceremony. And after that, it got me thinking, and I told Virginie, who's my partner in life and work, that maybe it's time we moved from Kinshasa and go and live in Kisangani. So at the beginning, it was like a private, a private thing, like we'll go to Kisangani, that will be like our retreat, and when we did to work, we'll come to this crazy city of 10 million, or around 10 million, that's called Kinshasa, we'll work from here. But immediately we got to Kisangani um, in September 2006, it was clear that that was an illusion, that it had to be a work in space. And now, Kisangani, which is a city where um, I grew up, when I was growing up there, I never dreamt of being an artist. You don't dream of such things um, there, because maybe today it's possible, but then it was like, just not possible. You dream of a job that your mother would be proud of, being a doctor, a lawyer. It's just that when I was 15, I started writing poetry and I have the misfortune of starting writing in reaction to a French teacher of mine who was like, who believed that the ultimate development for any literary career for an African person is the negritude movement. And so it was like, okay, I don't want to be in the negritude thing. So immediately you start writing, you're 15, but like with the consciousness, awareness of a history of literature, a history of intellectual thought. But when I went back there in, 2000, in yeah, 2006, in the city where even though I could never dream of becoming an artist, but I was dreaming of becoming a professor somewhere. And writing was like the thing I would do in the evenings. And when we were 15, 16, we were dreaming of changing African literature. At least that, very pretentious indeed. But if you're not pretentious when you're 15, then nothing can ever happen. But when I went back in 2006, I made a piece around um, the idea of returning home after 13 years. Where are my friends? The city is in ruins because the war had been through there. And, but the most important ruins were not the physical ones, but was in people's heads. And in the piece, there was a 14 minute video where I just interviewed a lot of people, young and not so young, asking them only one question, what's your dream? And to hear like a 20 year old saying, what's the point of dreaming here anyway? Maybe tomorrow there'll be another war. So my only dream now is to try and go to the bush, get some diamond, make some quick money and have fun. It's like, okay, if I'm wherever I am today, it's because I dreamt and it was in this city. What can I do here? So the Studio Kabako's project, which at the beginning was like just, yeah, we have these mental spaces. Suddenly it was like, hey, for these mental spaces to exist, we need to have physical spaces. And so came the idea that we should set up an art center, an art space. Then thinking about what is it that we'll do in this art center, it was like, okay, it has to be a lab for artists. It has to be a place where we can show work so a venue, but it also has to be a space where we are in a dialogue with the city. What does it mean to be, or to call myself an artist in a context like that one? What difference does it make, if at all it should make any difference? Um, what does it mean to be a citizen? And so, thinking about, while thinking about that, I met an architect. She is German, but she lives in Vienna. She's called Barbara Muller. And we had a very interesting conversation and she was talking about architecture in relation to the city in terms of acupuncture. She said that architecture for her should serve 
um, it should be like acupuncture points, and it's in the relationship between these points that it starts getting some energy traveling across the body or across the city. So then it was like, oh, maybe this is what we should do. So we decided to make our life really complicated and say we'll not create not one center, but three. So one will be dedicated to, it will be the artist lab, another one will be the public venue for showing work, and the third will be the space where we are in dialogue with the city. And this should be in three different parts of the city. And so started looking around. This is like a map, um, a Google Earth picture of the city of Kisangani. Kisanga, Kisangani literally means, it's from Swahili, it means on the island. And as you can see, you have the Congo River in the south. In the north, you have another big river, um, Chopo, and they meet somewhere here in the west. And the city is in the middle. But the city is on both sides of the Congo River. And down south is the most populated part of the city. You have like a quarter of the population living there between 200 and 250,000, because it's approximately a city of one million. We don't know exactly because the last census was in 1984. So 26 years later, many of us have died, but many more have been born, so, but approximately a million. But this part in the south, on the left bank of the Congo River, is like the most abandoned um, district in the city. Politicians only go there when you have elections, because you know that if the people of Lubunga um, give you their vote, you'll be one of the five members of parliament representing Kisangani in the city um, of Kinshasa in the National Assembly. And so, I don't know, what is Magic. <laughs> so we said that we should have, in, the, um, in this district, which is like the most neglected part of the city, the center where we'll be in a dialogue with the city. It's like the city talking to itself from its weakest limb, really. And then, around this area here, you have like what used to be co well, called the, the, the ville, because the Belgians made a very clear distinction when they developed these colonial cities between the city, which was the colonial neighborhood, the colonial city, that's where the white people lived, and the indigenous quarters, which were called La Cité. And so in, in most colonial cities, you have La Ville, which is here, and around here, you have the individual quarters, which is La Cité. And so, it's, and so even to date, that has remained in our vocabulary. People who live like here, they'd say, I'm going to the Ville. Je vais en ville, I'm going to the city. And, and so we said that because this is like the symbolic center of power, it would be important to have a space here. And this would be where we'll be showing work. And also to have the artist lab really outside the city where we can close doors and just be on, in our bubble and now, in the way energy circulates between these three, maybe we could start dreaming of having an impact at the scale of a city. And also developing three centers, it was a way of resisting the centralizing um, approach to life or public life that um, defines how we live in the Congo. For most people in Congo, outside Kinshasa, there is nothing. And that's why even in uh, the way we talk, we, in our hierarchy of spaces, you have Kinshasa as the gate, 
you have the inner country, it's like l'intérieur, and then you have the outside world that we call mikili. Literally, it means the worlds. It's as if we were outside the world ourselves. When you come to Europe or to America, finally you've traveled to the worlds, and Kinshasa is the gate to the worlds, and we have the inner country, which really doesn't exist. And even for the government, Everything is concentrated in Kinshasa. There is nothing outside Kinshasa. And when you come to Kisangani, if you have any project, most people would say, go to my Kisua, because this is the area where you have the least power supply interruptions, even though they suffer from that as well. So it's less difficult. So for us, it's like, I don't want to come here and create another monolithic thing. So we'll create three spaces and see how, so we have like a house for artists and they can come and show things here, but at the same time it's important to always be part of the city. And when we're here, it's not only about arts, maybe through the artist, because now I can be here and talk to you. If there is a problem with water supply, I could find, um, I could make the contact for that issue to be addressed with other people. So where are we at now, today, really? We bought a first piece of land here with the studio Kabako's money. It's like, I'd say that 90% of our money comes from touring and co-production. Um, we do receive like some support for some projects every now and then, maybe to, pay, to, to, to pay for air tickets to go to a festival, but 90% of our money is our own money. And so we bought a first piece of land here, but already there is uh, a legal issue, so it's in court, because the neighbors, which is a foot soccer club, claims that it's part of their land as well. So. We should know in the coming months if it's our, our land or not. Even though the guy we bought it from had all the official papers, but I came to understand that it doesn't mean anything, really. Having all papers doesn't mean anything. Then we bought a second piece of land here. And this is where we started the architectural process with Barbara Mueller. And we just broke the ground like two weeks ago. Right now, we are developing, building the foundations. And yeah, it should be completed this week if it doesn't rain too much, because there's a lot of rain um, right now and people just cannot work sometimes for two days. Yeah, it, everything is stopped. And here, the idea is to build a recording studio, because it's not only about dance or theater. Because one of the things that uh, I realized when I went back to Kisangani was that um, music, the music, especially rap music scene, was like the last um, art scene that was still alive in the, in the city. It's developed during the war. And so for me, it was clear that I had to work with them somehow. And so a recording studio was really in order. But we have so many stories to tell that started working with young people who were interested in video. We bought equipment, video uh, equipment. So we should also have a video production, post-production um, lab of course, dance and theater spaces. So like here, it will be like the multimedia recording and video space. Here, the dance and theater um, studios, administrative block. And because the land is fairly big, uh, it's like 4,200 square meters. How is that in feet or what, in square feet, whatever. 4,200 square meters. So we'd have these four blocks here with eight apartments, so we can have 
artists you know, um, who'd come and live and work there as well, with that as a communal space. So right now, what um, we're digging foundations for, it's like for the first block here, to have the recording uh, and video space, plus um, this, the communal space, which should serve in the beginning as an office. And then we'll see what will be other phases of our uh, development. And around, so this is Jeff. Whoa, yeah. Jeff was like the foreman with his team of six who were digging everything. And, and around, it's really a village. You know, it's a village. Um, there is no electricity um, on the site for now. But these are questions that will need to be addressed with time as, uh, as it continues. Maybe if now I could, yeah, I could pause and we see. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. I would uh, like to introduce Professor um, Okwe and Wiesen. Uh, we are very um, honored to have him here tonight. He's a uh, Nigerian born American art critic and curator. He was the artistic director of Documenta 11 exhibition in Germany in 1998 and 2002, and the seventh uh, Guangzhou Biennale in South Korea, 2008. He has curated numerous exhibitions in some of the most distinguished museums around the world, uh, uh, including um, Archive Fever, Uses of the Document in Contemporary Art, uh, which perhaps some of you may have um, m probably know. Um, the Short Century, Independence and Liberation Movements in Africa, 1945 to 94, um, has collaborated with various museums in Munich, Berlin, Museum of Contemporary Art of Chicago, PS1, Museum of Modern Art, New York, Tate Modern, uh, London, etc. His writings have appeared in numerous journals, catalogs, books, and magazines magazines, and he is also the editor of a four-volume publication of Documenta 11 called Platforms, Democracy Unrealized, Experiments with Truth, Transitional Justice and the Processes of Truth and Reconciliation, Creolite and Creolization, and Under Siege for African Cities, Freetown, Johannesburg, Kinshasa, and Lagos. We are very, very honored to have uh, Professor and Wieser join us tonight. Um, and uh, I'll also um, equally honored to have Professor Mamadou Diouf, who teaches here at Columbia. He is a professor of history and the director of the Institute for African Studies. He is a member of the Committee of Glo on Global Thought at uh, Columbia University. He's a professor, um, he, he leads the Columbia, uh, Columbia's Institute um, of African Studies and at the School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, he has taught in his native Senegal um, and guest lectured in many European and American universities. Uh, he's um, also a member of the editorial board of several professional journals, including the Journal of African History, and his research interests include urban, political, social, and intellectual history in colonial and post-colonial Africa. Please welcome Professor um, Okwin Wieser and Mamadou Diouf uh, to come and uh, talk with Fausta. It's your house, so. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just have the poster down, please? <laughs> well, I, I should say, thank you so much, um, Joanna, for 
uh, inviting me, <clears throat> and also most particularly for making it possible for me to finally meet Postar, um, whose work I've followed very avidly, and not only incredibly impressed um, with his conception of what is possible in Africa, but also for de you know, demonstrating what that possibility is. Um, I've had uh, numerous occasions to try to work with first time, but he's incredibly busy, obviously, building you know, this great center. Well, I, I think the, the whole you know, program of Ecogram um, is a, a very interesting one, and especially with the focus on Africa. And I think, uh, I, I don't want to sort of to begin this with any critique of, of uh, with any critique, but I think um, the, the focus on Africa and sustainability and development uh, seems to me in many ways uh, to really um, has a number of contradictions in them, this connection between sustainability development and Africa. Uh, and that those contradictions are contradictions that many of us have had to wrestle with for uh, decades. And it seems particularly now that it's impossible to reconcile those different tensions insofar as Africa is concerned. And I think that Faustin's work very clearly demonstrates an opportunity for a new um, topography, if you will, of the African um, urban space, uh, socio-political space, cultural space, and uh, economic space. So, I would like to really, my response obviously to this particular um, event, uh, short of really not having very much to say beyond this incredible presentation that Postan has made, um, is really to think about what, where to locate Postan's project. And it seems to me that one place to locate it is what I see as prevalent as a new movement currently taking shape not only in Africa, but in those parts of the world that one can now call the off-center, and that is the development of civic imagination. That Fostan's work, insofar as the city of Kisangani is concerned, is not just simply an art project, but how artists, and different sorts of producers create new zones of production that really goes beyond the way in which public life had been ordered by the state or controlled or these spaces of legitimization and legitimacy uh, that comes from NGOs, but rather the attempt to build new civic structures that are not just simply mediating zones between the elsewhere and the over here, but creating new, you know, sort of, you know, centers that then locates what the imagination of the African situation could be. And obviously, first time began with this notion of, of a, a kind of empty space, so to speak. He didn't quite put it that way. How to work in a place where there is seemingly nothing. With whom do you work? And how do you create a complex enough cultural ecology to make what you're going to do possible? And it strikes me that this question is not only a question uh, for first time, but a question for intellectuals, artists, producers, and organizations and institutions in African cities, particularly in the context of the collapse of civic and institutional structures in the structural adjustment program period. 
I'd say Africans have a very wonderful way of taking acronyms and really lending those acronyms a very, very succinct, powerful um, description because structural adjustment programs had become SAP. Now, SAP literally means to, in, you know, to basically to sap your energy, to destroy, to, in, in a sense, to, to render hollow any attempt to construct um, any kind of complex space. So SAP, I think it's perhaps possible to talk about this context in the, in the context of SAP, not the context of structural adjustment program, and to understand how artists and intellectuals have tried to cope with this process of deracination because it is in the attempt to cope with deracination that one refuses to be an exile. And I think this is really one point. The second point is to connect Faustin's civic project with the project of other African artists because this was a question that was starkly very clear for a group of eight artists in Dakar with facet, and these were artists who, you know, contemporary artists whose trajectories constantly took them to Europe, took them to those spaces of legitimization, those spaces of legit, you know, legitimation and legitimization and so on. And at some point in the late 90s, this group of artists asked themselves the question, how can they respond to the critical context in which they were working, in which their work would not necessarily be to serve the global contemporary art market? So they developed a new project which was predicated on an exchange, on a transfer of knowledge between those who lived in La Ville and those who lived in La Cité. I think it's very important this distinction that Faustin has constructed for us between those spaces of authority and power, La Ville and La Cité. And I think it's important because I just came back from South Africa where that you know, distinction is so starkly you know, clear in the apartheid regime where the, Europe, the African city is a city that is deeply marked by this racial violence and political violence. So how do you make this connection between those who live in the city, the colonial city, and those who live on the outskirts? And those who live on the outskirts are those who live on the landscape of invisibility. Those are the people who are not able to be seen. So with facet was trying to make this connection between themselves living in Dakar and a group of villagers who live in the Casamance region in the northern part of Senegal. And the goal was not to take up the developmentalism of NGOs in which you, know, you go to where you consider to be middle of nowhere, you put a source of running water in the center of, this, of some place and villagers would travel three miles in all directions to come and collect the water. So it was not about developmentalism. Whitfuss's project was a critique of development and therefore a critique of NGOism. And I think it's important to sort of to really take this on board when we think in terms of Africa and how one can empower things in Africa. That it should not just simply be about giving something, but really creating networks of exchange. So Wit Facet's work was really about an attempt to create a new network of exchange. And that exchange was about a transfer of knowledge, not and the sharing of knowledge, not about giving anything material, but really working at the core of what was lacking in those communities, which is to revitalize the imagination as a tool of social and political and economic emancipation. This project, I believe, and I presented this project in Castle in 2002, was also linked to another project in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the work of Group Emos, 
Group Emos is a collective of, a of intellectuals, activists, artists, dramat you know, dramaturgs who came together in the post, you know, in not post Mobutu, during the time that Mobutu was in power. In it was constituted, the group was constituted in 1989. And the group took its name from the Bible from Prophet Amos, whose central interest was on the notion of social justice. And here again, this group intervention into the local space was essentially about, again, creating ways to reactivate the imagination. So these civic processes I see as something really very important and new, a way of really rethinking the paradigm of the African cities that we've inherited over a very, you know, many years. Again, I was in Nigeria recently in, in, um, in July, and it was very striking how the research of somebody like Rem Kuhas had become obsolete, simply because that iconography of chaos that was re replicated constantly in the last 10 years in Lagos had disappeared for some reason. Because Lagos has a new, young, dynamic governor who, in his view, resisted the notion that the chaotic situation of Lagos as it was then was in fact the future that was being announced for other cities. And so this, in a sense, was a way to sort of to reverse this imagination, this notion that the, the, the crisis that was part of the Lagos landscape was in fact its future, as was predicted. I mean, I suppose Ku has, in, you know, to his credit, had done an enormous and incredible uh, urban analysis of Lagos, sort of showing different points in how the city connected to itself. But what was left in the minds of many people was not that analysis. It was really the iconography of intractability. And being in Lagos to see what was really going on, how new civic developments were connecting different parts of the city, again, brought up this question of how to think Africa today beyond sustainability, beyond developmentalism. I will leave it here so perhaps maybe Mamadou's um, you know, talk can help us link up with other possibilities of what is happening uh, in different parts of Africa. Well, thank you. I would like first to thank the Graduate School for inviting me to participate in this discussion and for giving me the opportunity to meet Foster. I have read Foster's work and, you know, from a perspective which is a perspective of a historian and a historian interested in understanding these new processes, the way in which uh, cities in particular since independence have been imagined and reimagined by not only institutions, the state on one hand, but also by, by artists and by city dwellers. And one thing which comes back in any discussion about African cities these last at least 20 years is a discussion about a crisis, a crisis of governance, a crisis of governability, but also a crisis around infrastructure and around the control of the space and all over Africa, the control of garbage. Dirt is one of the key issues, not only for inhabitants, but also for artists. And I think Foster has, has precisely talked about that, about and the location of these free spaces they are imagining and trying to build, is a space to understand actually how the city, Kisangani in this case, but you can take Dakar, we can take Lagos, how these cities breathe, and precisely how could they be imagined and an imagination from the present. And one of the first shift, which is important, and he indicated it, is the shift from an imagination of those cities, which are a literary 
centralized imagination. The city should display the identity of the new regime, the new nationalist regime, to, to a city which is imagined visually, which is, which is painted, which is more and more taken over by its own inhabitants. And one of the first effects, Faustin has talked about, you have talked about, is city became a fragmented space. We move from a centralized city showcasing the project of the new nationalist class to a city which is a city of neighborhoods. And neighborhoods taken over by the residents of the neighborhood. And in many of the African situation, in particular, after the structural adjustment moment or during the structural adjustment moment, where basically the state retreated from very specific space to control the, la ville, the population were in a position to take over and reinvent actually not only the space, and it's where the discussion about development and sustainability becomes an interesting uh, discussion because the tension uh, which many of these cities are, are experiencing for these last 20 years are a tension between what we, social sustainability on one hand and the issue of governability. Who should govern the city? Who should define the identity in particular the cultural identity of the city, and what are the actors which are actually fighting to control the city is one of the important issues. Where artists and intellectuals are more and more, uh, and playing a more important role, at least in these last 10 years, by first redefining ways in which uh, a citizenship should be exercised. And one aspect which seems to be very, very important is really the role in which art and artists are, are, are playing in reinventing new form of citizenship. But the new languages which are also projected in the space and reconfiguring the space in which people are, 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 are operating. And, and one aspect which for me is important in looking at at the work of Faustin is the tension between history and memory. History, which is in many of his African situation, the history of the state, and the state becoming a historian. Without the resources, in many cases. Uh, 10 years after independence, states and ruling classes are no longer in a position to trace the direction the society should head towards, which is of integration. What we are living, as I was saying, is, is a fragmentation. And this fragmentation is providing new narratives. If, if I take the case I know better, the case of Senegal and the case of Dakar, at this moment, the most important moment of crisis is the late 80s and early 90s, where you know you have a kind of revolt of the youth in Dakar, uh, protesting against the you know the, 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 the mounting pile of garbage all over the city, but deciding actually to clean up the city and using the dirt in the city as a metaphor for actually the corruption of the state. What we really experience is the rediscovery uh, of a memory which, uh, which is the memory of the past against the nationalist memory. And the process is not only a process of renaming the streets, but it's also a process of embellishing the, the city, not only cleaning it up, but embellishing it and taking it over and producing literally a new language and producing a new memory. And 
for a historian like me, what is really interesting is precisely the new cultures and new modes of governance what, uh, you know, that are emerging through the process. What I call here new culture, first I talked a little bit about, but you insisted, and your work is really about that, is, is the emergence of an urban culture, which is no longer related to an absence. The rural culture, which is supposedly the authentic culture of an Africa. I think this is the first time in the late 80s that urban African societies are literally redefining themselves as, as, as urban society. And one thing which is interesting is what Fosten was talking about, the idea of moving from a, a, a space in which your body is contained to a space which is redefined from your own body and where the opening of a space, the possibility of convergence is much more important than the, the, the type of movement which define actually probably until the mid 70s African cities where Africans have been able even for the bill to subvert it by reintroducing their own ethnic and religious allegiances into a city which was trying, in some cases, to, 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 to contain them in its outskirts. And what shows it very clear, if you read African novels, the city is the dangerous space. It's where the African is losing his, her values is also losing his uh, own, uh, own identity. And what is interesting in projects like For Sense Project is precisely not only the reappropriation of these rural resources and the recycling into urban objects, but also the, the appropriation of the colonial traces in the city and their uses in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. But depending on the regions we are considering, reactions are different. I, I, I was really interested by Fosten's talk about a world outside the world of the African, which is, and this is his project in comparison to the project you talk, a project of reappropriation of a space which has been experienced in crisis for so long and bloody crisis. And in West Africa, where you know, uh, uh, West African societies have been part of a larger world but since the, the Atlantic slave trade, actually, where looking, you know, outside is more important. It's quite interesting that, you know, what is going on in Central Africa, which is a kind of process of vernacularization of the outside world is done but very differently in West Africa. You know, young rappers, Senegalese rappers are, are saying, you know, uh, differently to uh, what Fosten was insisting, uh, that Dakar and New York, uh, that Paris and New York are suburbs of Dakar. <laughs> they are returning, you know, this kind of specialization, insisting on their globalization. It's what explains also that these kids have been taking canoes, you know, to cross the Atlantic, you know, many of them drowning, which shows, I think, this, this very interesting way of reimagining the past to invent new histories. And in the case of Dakar, this reimagining lasted less than five years. 1988, you have, you know, a storm flooding, a city which was, you know, smelling, you cannot imagine, with flies all over, a crisis with Mauritania and a lot of killings. Of, of Mauritanian in Senegal and Senegalese in Mauritania. And suddenly overnight, 
thousands of young people deciding to clean up the city. And to paint the city, wall painting, all over the city. And new history is being told, and new narrative painted all over. And as a historian, is what I was invented in. I began working on, on, on this reimagining, I call it reimagining of the city. When I began seeing, you know, on the walls references, historical references, and I try to understand where were the references coming from, what does it relate to a space which, which is a colonial and post-colonial state which had a memory which was a, what I call a technocratic memory, a memory of its infrastructure, what we are calling. How do you actually infuse a kind of soul in a city without a soul? And as I say, it lasted no more than five years, but it's reinvented a new culture, not only a painting culture, again, you know, in relation to what we were saying about Negritude, this is a painting which was a reaction against uh, Senghor's fine art understanding of uh, the pictural revolution in, in Senegal. But it's also a reinvention of a new music. Before rap, it was what the Senegalese were calling Vambalakh, which is a music which is celebrating the body. A and this is also one of the most important rupture in the way in which Senegalese men and women began actually performing their body in the city and occupying bodily the city. And this music, which is a music for dance, and dancing became very, very important. And, the, and, and again, probably one of the most important success of Senegal today is precisely around music and dance. And the, the, the inventivity of our dance in Senegal is something which is unbelievable because precisely of this rediscovery the rediscovery of the, core of, 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 of the body. And this is for the first time, uh, you know, these years between 1990 and 2000, that for the first time, the body of a man is displayed on a wall and portrayed as a beautiful body. It's the body of a wrestler, which is funnily adopted as a nickname, Tyson. <laughs> but he's interesting, and I will conclude that, that he was interesting because he represented an idea of the outside, what he was talking Every time he was actually wrestling, the stadium will be divided into two camps, a camp which is supporting Tyson, and they will wave American flags, <laughs> and the other camp which is the Senegalese one, people waving Senegalese flag, which shows precisely the tension, which is the tension which is defining today many of those African cities. And the fact that today uh, different groups in different fragments of the city are not necessarily reinventing the city as such, but are reinventing new neighborhood with a new language, which is the language which is attaching them to both the local and the global. Thank you. If you have, if you if you would like to say something, and then open it up to questions. Well, hearing these perspectives from other parts of the continent is really kind of, yeah, I would say, gives more energy to suddenly feel less alone, and it's so important not to feel alone, because it's not easy. Yeah, and yeah, like for our project. For now, we carry everything on our, you know, 
on our shoulders as uh, as a structure, the Studio Caracos, and so yeah, n knowing that somewhere else on the continent, but definitely beyond, there are other ex experiences you can relate to. That's a first point that's really yeah very encouraging. Maybe. I, could, I, I just want to read something here. This is a text from 2005, I think. I was invited to teach in Cork in Ireland, and just before that, I wrote a text, and somewhere there it was like, how do I walk to myself to my people when my, when my blood is on fire and my history in ruins? One possible answer, I said it earlier on, land of exile or native land, perhaps everywhere is but exile. Perhaps my only true country is my body. I'll thus survive like a song that's never been written. Another possible answer, now that we've met in this space, comrade, let's stop for a while and sit side by side. I'll tell you my name and sing my national anthem or whatever I remember of it, and you'll tell me yours. Then we'll go our separate ways, leaving behind a fragile scent, our presences like shadows in dust. Is this dance? Is this art? Is this contemporary African dance? How will I know if this is art? Do you call art one's attempt to resist to the cycle of destruction by planting seeds of beauty, seeds of dreams in a hopeless context? What then when this resistance is written in one's body, the body as the last shield for freedom? Okay, now I'm going round and round the same circles. I feel confused and lost. I guess I have to shut up now enough of this futility, contemporary African art, my foot. In any case, I don't give a damn about Ac Africa. Whenever I write, it's saved strictly for myself, for a few friends, and to appease the course of time. That's a, a quote from George Louis Borges. My time. Why the hell should I care about Africa? My portion of Africa doesn't care about me. Years of war, raped women, epidemics, w millions killed, that's my legacy from my fathers. At best, I'm left with some energy to survive on my heap of ruins. Independent State of Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Zaire, King Leopard II, Mobutu, Lumumba. Well, fine, if Africa doesn't give a damn. All that matters is whether my grandmother cares. For I know how strange an animal contemporary creation is, the question is, how can I create a sense of identification with such a weird medium? Could, that, could she, my grandmother, ever say after seeing my dance, well, I don't understand anything, and yet I recognize it. So my dance will be an attempt to cock up spaces of encounters. This discussion and the response is incredibly profound. Um, and thank you very much for opening up these issues for us. And I'm very much hoping that we'll continue to be thinking about them for the rest of the Ecogram series. And right now, I would like us to uh, I'd like to see if there are any excuse me any questions from the audience. I know that a lot of these issues are very very interesting to architects, uh, especially specifically issues of urban space. Um, uh, and, and so, are there any questions? Yeah? To make a new building for, for the art center and whether the other two um, points that you're talking about, are you going to be going into existing buildings or are, they both, are, are, all, are all of them new structures that you need to build? Well, because the country today is not even in the process of reconstruction, we just need to construct everything. Everything has been destroyed. 
So definitely there will be new buildings. But for now we begin with one, and in fact like just a first module in that one, we cannot fund everything anyway because we're doing it on our own. If we have to fund everything, it would take maybe 15 years to complete. And so later on we should move on. No. Uh, but definitely it has to be new because there is, what can you do when it's ruins? How do you keep ruins standing? It's down already. But then everything is down. Um, this is actually a quote from a writer from Congo Brazzaville, Sonila Butansi, he wrote, um, okay, I'll try and translate. Everything was down. Even the earth was down, but the people were still there. I would like to ask a more dance-related question, if I may. I, I saw your beautiful performance with Raymond Hoag the other night, called Sans Titre. And uh, I was wondering if you could say, Faustin, a few words about how that work connects to the concerns you've been talking about here. Well, this work by um, German choreographer, Raymond Hoger, I collaborated uh, in the work as a performer, relates to my own work and my own concerns in, um, in that Raymond has, um, Raymond's work is known, at least now it's been shown um, in the US, but for the past 15 or 20 years in Europe, this is work that has been dealing with the question of memory and history and how do you deal uh, with those questions and how do you find the strength to continue with your life from wherever you are. But what um, I find interesting about Raymond's response to those questions is that it's the sense of openness that he, um, his work um, brings forward and, and so you have this really, so it goes, it's like a space for entering into silence. And the spaces that we're trying to create in the Congo, maybe because yeah, Kinshasa or even Kisangani, it's a very noisy space. I have a friend who wrote that we are really afraid of silence because maybe so many ghosts come up, so we need to make as much noise as possible because we don't want to face our ghosts. And yet, I think that if we can be able to look into ourselves and build with our fears, that could be a way forward. And so the work with Raymond reminds me of the necessity for those spaces, for silence and for stillness, which for a dancer could, could, could sound from the onset like paradoxical. How do you aim for stillness when you're a dancer? But maybe that's like the ultimate dance. So that's a at a very intimate level, but also that can translate in the work as we're approaching it there. Just make just a very quick comment, which you know relates to Faustan's you know center and the attempt to sort of to locate the center in three different places, and and I and I suppose and following up with what Mamadou also said that this really is an attempt, uh, a demand for complication, in terms of how we think about the African city. You know, because on the one hand, um, I, I think you know s the s city making f initiatives um, oftentimes really focus exclusively on infrastructure, and not in terms of Africa today, what we deal with are deficits, 
but not in terms of the cellular relationships that continuously um, need to be emphasized because of the constant ruptures of violence that have made cities, you know, really not about city making, but about nation making. Because to think about African cities is really to think about national forms, not about urban forms. And this is particularly important when we remember that if we counteract the notion of la ville and la cité, the native quarter, which is la cité, the place that Fanon describes where, you know, the natives live, and la ville, where all the garbage disappear <laughs> into <laughs> into the you know the garbage boxes. So when we really think about this, the, the reason why cities become centers of contestation for the national form, I think it's important to sort of to take this up because this design, this spreading out of the three locations, seems to me to be one way not just simply to remake the city but really to create a conduit for different forms of national negotiation. Mm -hmm. And in a place like the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, which has been really embroiled in decades of internecine warfare, warfare of different grades, ethnic warfare, <laughs> neighborhood warfare, all of that, this conception of the three locations, for me, suddenly, I mean, it's, 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 it's just a flash of something that is really quite important, that it takes a leap over the ways in which we think the urban, that is here is the national that is being imagined. And it's really quite uh, amazing to me, as, especially if you've paid attention to uh, you know, when, you know, so just like in France today, the expulsion of the Roma is not about the city, it's about the nation. It's about the really the national body. So this notion of the city that is embodied in the work of Foster is something that is really quite powerful. One way to sort of to think about it because it's one thing that can never be dispossessed. You can dispossess a physical space but the embodied you know, space can never be dispossessed unless you know, it's a body you know, that gets killed. So I just wanted to make you know, this connection mm -hmm. between the, the national form and the urban form and the constitution of these linkages in the three centers. And maybe I just in relation to the body as uh, I'm listening to you talk, one thing that but looking through the history of the country, but history in general, one thing that um, I'm beginning to realize is that it can be studied under um, the prism of like how the violence against the body evolves, different forms of violence against the body. And in a country like that one where, even though it's called democratic republic, speech doesn't exactly circulate in the public space, therefore leaving all this huge space for rumors, uh, because that's like the only discourse that can exist, the bodies begin um, to play an incredible role um, in, in like trying to define you know, um, new spaces of freedom, new ways of saying what words cannot say. And therefore, as a dancer, that's really like an interesting locus of exploration. One last question, Ben says. Mabel. Oh. Hi. Um, I just had a question. You were speaking before about um, how whenever there was a problem in Congo that 
the people would look externally t for solving that problem, whether it was IMF or uh, World Bank or something like that. I guess my question is somehow, how do you envision um, architecture and dance, whether separately or together or in parallel, that they would take or provide a, whether it's a platform or a route where somehow the people of Congo can kind of internalize and um, give themselves the power to sort of take on the problems and solve it for themselves. And you spoke about something about like nation building and nation, is there maybe a, a nation dance or a nation architecture that needs to be created or is it providing a safe haven or how do you envision, what are the roles of architecture and dance and provide kind of, I guess I'm it, um, assuming or taking Congo forward to a position where they feel that it's, we don't need external help kind of thing. Okay, first of all, it's kind of, um, I'm not imagining this at the scale of the country, but we're talking of smaller scale, which is that of the city. And inside that city, and this is something that um, like when I look at the independent, the history of independence movements in, the, um, in Africa in general, it was not the mass. You had a handful of people who started to understand what was going on and they could lead other people to some places. So what you're seeing, what um, today um, I'm hoping that these spaces in Kisangani could provide would be like a space where new ways of thinking oneself as a leader could emerge. And if you have two, three people who can continue this, that's already a force. But it's at that scale, and maybe it will take a hundred years to start thinking, but then I'll not be there to see. Thank you. One last, we will take one last question from Mabel Wilson. Um, hello. Thank you. I, I, it was a really fantastic panel, and, and I think the things that you're sort of bringing forward about the future of the, you know, the, the African city, but I think the question of the urban in general, which isn't just African, but I think is a global question. And, and actually, Faustin, I think you answered the question I was going to ask you, which was about the role of memory in your project. Because I do think that there is something about the way in which history becomes a kind of, you know, sort of a structuralization of pastness by the state, so that history does become the grand narrative that I think you beautifully described as just layered up by names. and and monumentality, which can also be, with, for architects, the kind of monumentality of modernism. Um, and I'm wondering in what ways does memory begin to operate both within space and then perhaps between those three points that you mark on the map? How, how do bodies move between those three places? How does the city start to merge out of the ability to kind of move between those three axes that then perhaps become habit and everyday experience and then memory and perhaps knowledge that then is passed on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I and mean, maybe that is, is that part of the plan? Is that something that you imagine happening? See, during the, um, during the, during the war at some point, all cars disappeared from the city because they were either taken away by the military from the people, or there was simply no gas, so. And then people remembered that bicycles were very, actually very sustainable means of transportation. <laughs> no pollution whatsoever, <laughs> and so there were transporting everything. And so human bodies and goods, everything on bicycles. And we call them tolika. You translate literally by let's move on. But then the tolikist 
for the, as we call them. They call themselves, they call one another combatants, the fighters. I think that seems to me like a way of responding to the context and finding ways to circulate in there. Like right now, we're not waiting, for instance, for these centers to exist, to begin occupying that city. So like in 2007, I received this award from the Dutch royal family. It was 100,000 100, euros from the Prince Klaus Fund, so decided that 70% of that money should go into acquiring equipment, sound, lights, and video equipment, so that you can start doing stuff there. And so, like, now we rent a house in the middle of the ville, where we have our offices, storage spaces, but also a recording studio. But then we stage events in the city. And like around the 50th anniversary of Congo's independence, we organized an event which we called Three Days for 50 Years. And it was like a way for us to revisit historical important spaces in the city, to take our bodies there, stage events, free events, because the people of Kisangani pay me differently anyway. I can, I make my money outside Congo. They feed me differently, so mm -hmm. that's the only thing to show appreciation is to stage free events. And by the simple fact of like organizing a very important uh, event on the left bank um, where nobody goes. And this was like the first time there was such an event, it was in the ruins of the railway station, and it was broadcast live on a new local TV station. People it's like, no, this cannot be Lubunga, because the neighborhood is called Lubunga. This cannot be Lubunga. This is definitely uh, something from Kinshasa. And then people are calling this station, it's like, is this really Lubunga? It's like, yes. <laughs> and, and so, getting people from the right bank to go to the left bank, and see that, hey, something interesting can happen also on this side. Because when you're um, by the river and you look to the left bank in, um, at night, it's dark. There is no electricity there. Mm -hmm. There is electricity on the other side. So that's like already a way of beginning to occupy physically and to get some bodies to crisscross and move and meet. When will that take us? Don't know. I think one interesting aspect is that the state is no longer controlling the space. Mm. And in some cases, the, space, uh, the state is not interested at all. On one hand, on the other, people are investing this quote-unquote liberated space and producing their own narrative. I think is why what Faustin is doing is important, is the opening of space and the possibility for people to produce their own narrative. And such narrative are against the meta narrative. Again, to, to take a case of Senegal, you know, the old president of Senegal just inaugurated <laughs> this huge, crazy, you know, Monuments. monument of the African Renaissance, $70 million, mm. uh, you, you know, which is completely crazy. You know, the man looked like a Korean. Russian. <laughs> <laughs> the woman looked like a French woman, and you ask yourself, what does it mean? But it's precisely <laughs> what has <laughs> happened, that, that they no longer, this president has, does not have a space for a narrative which is acceptable for the population. What does it mean? It means something which is simple. The imagining of a nation of the 60s was a unitary and authoritarian 
imagination. The new one is why the multiplication of spaces is so important. It's a pluralistic imagination. And we have to rediscover a history which is not necessarily a history of conversion, but a history of, con of conflict and negotiation mm -hmm. and keep negotiating that. This is today what one of the lessons we are learning from, from, from artists which are trying to understand and participate really in the creation of what we were calling this, this new civic imagination. I think this might be a good place to end. I wanted to thank um, <coughs> our participants, maybe end with, um, with a final uh, sort of note or, or thought of that I had by listening to you, um, thinking about uh, the um, Faustan's in incredible, in a way, artistic kind of generosity and what can that, um, w is there some model there that we as architects can, uh, you know, can use? Um, and perhaps think about that um, there, there could be new practices that uh, might not hold development and sustainability completely um, aside, but, but that they might start to kind of overlap in new and interesting ways. And I think that that may be a thought that we keep now for, uh, that opened up tonight, but for the rest of the conference. Thank you again for incredible uh, presentations and discussion uh, and um, see, you see you Thursday at Studio X. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.